Welcome back to SuperCloud 7, where we're exploring the next era of data platforms and the rise of intelligent data apps. We're with Bob Muglia, uh, former head of enterprise division at Microsoft and CEO formerly um, in, the, in the stages up to and just before the launch of one of the greatest enterprise software IPOs ever at Snowflake, and now um, an investor, an advisor, and a friend of the Cube. Welcome, Bob. Good to see you, George. All right, so let's kick off with um, the the changing source of truth. We we had we had for the first era of data platforms that the DBMS owned the data. Now that we're moving to open table formats, let's first sort out where we are from your point of view with the open table formats, and then what the new source of truth is. Okay, a lot has happened this year. I mean, we have been in a situation where we've had Delta and Iceberg. Uh, as two alternative, Hootie being a third alternative catalog format or, or table format uh, for data lakes. And, you know, a lot has happened. Uh, our friends at Databricks bought Tabular, which was the creator of Iceberg. And uh, we'll see how this develops. So in a way right now, uh, Databricks has controlling uh, controlling capability of both the Iceberg and the Delta formats. But this is important to all the other vendors. And um, we'll just watch what happens over the coming months. I mean, I do think that we'll continue to see coexistence of these two things. In the last year, fortunately, uh, there have been tools that have been developed to allow for both to be used simultaneously. Uh, there's a tool called Xtable that copies the metadata between these two things. Fortunately, the, the, the data formats all use the same on-disk format for data, and it's really just the metadata we're talking about. But I do think we'll see those things converging, and I expect to see um, an open source uh, uh, capability coming out, an open source uh, environment coming out that will be adopted pretty much universally across the vendors. That's what I hope to see anyway. At the moment, it's a little bit of a cacophony still, but but it seems like like some things are going to happen here. And certainly they can converge. I mean, certainly what's true is, is that is that they all do the same thing. They just do it differently. So that's the first thing that's happening. And then the second thing that seems to be happening is catalogs are being built on top of these, uh, these open data lake formats. And collectively between a catalog and the underlying data format, that really is your source of truth. And um, right now we have a bunch of those being developed and they're not very compatible with each other. And once again, my guess is that's just early stages of things and we'll start to see something emerging that could be um, compatible and, and used across multiple vendors. But that's certainly not where we are at the moment. So we're early stages of this transition from, from, you know, from where we have proprietary formats to an open format, but the industry hasn't quite settled on, on it yet. So let me ask you about this this source of truth because this is interesting. Where it's it's not just the data, um, and then when we talk about the metadata, is it the technical metadata like you see in Polaris, um, the Snowflake um, Iceberg catalog, or is it all the way to the operational catalog that you would have in in Horizon and Unity? Well, it has to start with the the technical operational data because because you know the the, the data warehouses. Uh, and tools that run in the in the data environment have to be able to work with the data in a cohesive and secure way. So it has to include all that. But I think over time it will include the higher the higher levels of semantics as well. This is one of those open questions. Nobody really knows how that's going to develop. Uh, as you go up the stack and try and do more and more, you may want to have more and more capabilities, which could be an opportunity for vendor differentiation as well. So we'll see. We'll see. It's still it's still early on that, but both are really required. Certainly, the operational data is required, but more and more people are recognizing that you have to have some kind of semantic model for your business and for your data in order to certainly have the large language models work the way you would expect them to work. So okay, I'm I'm hearing two things. Let me let me push on this. Um, it sounds today like we know that we know that Unity from from um, Databricks is read only for metadata for any vendor other than Databricks, except for the metric definition layers from at scale DBT and uh, Cube. Now, what I was going to ask is: Is there a way to break off? the technical metadata from the operational metadata from the richer semantics, or if you want a coherent source of truth, do they all need to have one underlying sort of unifying owner? 
don't think you think you need one engine for it. I think you need to have a way of accessing the data coherently across multiple en engines potentially. Um, you know, so that if you had, for example, uh, knowledge graph database processors that would want to work with the same information that that a SQL database would be working with. So some of the same metadata is required in it, but then there's a lot more information that one could put in the higher level semantic layer. And in fact, if you look at that, you want to. There's a lot of operations that you want to perform on that data, and these look like graph. They're graphs, and they're complicated graphs, and there are relational operators that can be applied across all of those graphs. And today's databases and today's catalogs, neither one of them do that. Neither one of them do that. You need something different, which I, you know, which I believe is a relational knowledge graph, which we're starting to see emerge now. But does that does that relational knowledge graph need to be the unifying data structure across the different catalogs? In other words, do the catalogs need a unifying source of truth, or do we risk fracturing the metadata? I think ultimately you need to have a vision across all of the underlying metadata to get a consistent source of truth. Again, this is really early. Um, we're really just beginning to see the emergence of this metadata as in this semantic layer as a, as, as a real thing. It is being stored in a wide variety of different ways right now. There are some catalogs people are putting it in. Frankly, I think the most common place to put it right now is a bunch of YAML files. And and I mean, I know that's not going to hold. I mean, that's a temporary state of, of, of being uh, because you can't perform the kind of operations you would want to perform on the data if it's just in that simplistic of a format. But, it, you know, what we're seeing is the early emergence of this. And I think what you'll see is both higher level tools emerging, you know, from from the vendors, from the platform vendors like Databricks and Snowflake and Microsoft and everyone else. Um, but then also some of these higher order order um, uh, things existing, both from catalog vendors as well as from special purpose uh, uh, knowledge graph vendors. Okay. Um, let, let me ask you a Snowflake specific question because they're they've always been they had the best engine, and and in this migration to a more metadata centric or catalog centric world. Um, their implementation is still an extension of their engine. So what I wanted to know was like a, a couple things. One, right now, Polaris is an adjunct to ha um, Horizon, and it's a way to essentially synchronize the governance policies from Horizon to your um, unmanaged iceberg tables. So it gives you a single way to govern, you know, your data, your iceberg data estate along with your, your Snowflake native. So my question is, um, right now, Unity is read-only for third parties. Might Polaris grow into something where they collected more metadata from outside the Snowflake managed part of the data estate, where let's say, um, let's say there was a way to partner with DBT and Daxter and orchestrate low-end workflows, low-end transformation and or ingest and transformation workflows um, using Fivetran and DuckDB, not because they could make a lot of money on that, but because the lineage graph is the new system tables and all operational metadata is going to be built around that. And so Polaris could grow into something not just for technical metadata, but where uh, a richer ecosystem of metadata would be um, grafted onto this lineage graph. I mean, I think that's certainly a, a viable possible outcome of things. I mean, the way to sort of think about it right now is in the case of both Databricks and 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 Snowflake, you know, in order to write to the the underlying uh, table format, um, in the case of Databricks, data, Databricks, it's Delta. In the case of Snowflake, it's Iceberg. You can go through the engine to do that, but you can also write those things directly. And and in fact, Fivetran has you know when we when we came out with our support for tables for open data lake formats supporting both Iceberg and Delta. At first, we supported the engines and supported supported for example Delta through writing through Databricks. We're now writing those beginning to write those tables directly, and you know that reduces the cost to the customer because the tables are written and they don't have to go through the, the SQL engine. But that implies that the metadata has to get updated, and so the the APIs are present to do that. And I think we're starting to see people people go in that direction. 
over time, I think these semantics are going to get richer and richer, and they're all they all can be stored inside these catalogs. And the problem is just really we're at a stage where there is no standard for this at the moment. And and again, I, I think that will change over the next few years, but it's going to take a little bit of time for these things to emerge. And customers who want to get ahead will choose, you know, and start to work with this and work with these more sophisticated models and work with this metadata. We'll have to choose something that is potentially proprietary for a, for a while and then migrate to the open formats as they become available. Fortunately, I don't think that will be too difficult. I mean, I think it'll be doable because the data can be transferable. And but but what I'm thinking about here in this specific instance, I'm thinking vendor centric because I, and you're thinking customer centric. And I'm thinking right now, Snowflake is is still thinking, how do we extend our DBMS, you know, and build the operational catalog on it? And what I'm wondering is um right now, because Unity is trying to capture the the operational metadata, um from a, a broader data estate so that their tools which work on anything essentially unity you know defines or unity tracks i'm saying maybe snowflake could turn polaris into something more like unity but that is read right to the ecosystem i, I expect that to happen george I okay that to happen george Okay. And, and, and it, it has to happen. And I think it del I think that, that the same thing will happen in the data in the Databricks side. And okay. hopefully these things won't be totally different things. I mean, you know, today they're totally different things. Hopefully that, that doesn't stay that way over time. Uh, in part, it has to happen because in for the case of Snowflake in particular, because um, and this is one of the big differences between the Snowflake strategy and the Databricks strategy is Databricks is kind of saying we've built a data a data uh, uh, processing environment that and we're doing it all for you. We'll have tools that do everything for you. And um, you can just, you know, we're a one-stop shop vendor. Snowflake has been very much an ecosystem, focusing on building an ecosystem around this and actually creating a platform. To me, it's, you know, this is the, one of the, the most, I, I've long said these people are building, they started from different places, but they're building kind of the same thing, but they're not exactly the same because Snowflake is taking a much more platform-centric approach. And when you take a platform-centric approach, you have to have multiple ways of doing things. You have to have the ability for external vendors to participate. You know, once again, like how can Fivetran load the data into Iceberg and then update all the, 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 the tables, tables and semantic, not just the operational data, but the, the application-specific spe semantic metadata that Fivetran has available because it knows it's pulling the data from Salesforce or wherever it's getting it, wherever the data is coming from. And that's very relevant to the business process. That all needs to go into this into a single metadata repository, a catalog, so to speak. And and I, you know, that will happen. And it, you know, okay. today it happens in ways that are proprietary. Over time, I think it'll be much more standardized. Then then last question on on Snowflake, which is you know, where this is there's this one version is where they talk with partners that that might be the source of the of the lineage graph, getting into um origination um or ingest and transformation that they might not access themselves. But right now, um George Fraser um thinks of uh, uh, he's founder of Five Tran, as you know. Um, when he benchmarks it, he thinks that about um 20% of Snowflake workloads are ingest, 30% are transformation, and he thinks that they are um, no longer all that price competitive in those workloads. And so we know that there's the business model issue of Snowflake selling a fully, you know, fully loaded uh, infrastructure and software offering. And I'm wondering, as a former Snowflake CEO, might there be a way to do a Snowflake skew that's software only? where like Databricks, there's special pricing for more price sensitive workloads so that the ingest and transformation with a software only workload wouldn't undercut the premium workloads, but might get them you know, access to workloads they can't get to, get to today or that they're losing today. Sure, that's that's possible. I mean, it and and I could see Snowflake doing that if in fact they're, that was necessary for them to meet the needs of their customers. I, I know we'll see. They could also they could also just change the way they're doing things and, and having that be used as a cost reduction for uh, like Snowpipe as an example is an example of a way of doing data loading in Snowflake that is lower cost than just than than um, than just using a data warehouse 
and you know they could lower the price of that or whatever or perhaps provide broader capabilities on that to do more transformations but we'll see over time we'll see okay. i don't know this is you know it, it's interesting i think that that i'm not sure wh where customers are pushing on this I think they want to move to a standardized data lake format, and they want to do so in a way that that certainly uh, doesn't increase their cost and doesn't doesn't uh, and also meets their governance requirements. You know, one of the hardest things with these data lakes is there's a lot of governance issues that can open up with it, and that's why some of these catalogs and and you know the catalogs and the 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 rights management capabilities that are built on top of it are so important. But we'll see over time. We'll see over time. Just loading the data in to 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 iceberg directly is a significant savings and cost for the customer. Right. And th that's an example of, yeah, it's cheaper yeah, without going pay, through the- They don't have to go through the snowflake load or Databricks load process. I mean, right. this is one of those things. And, and this, is, this is like, say, Fivetrain is just releasing that those capabilities now. And I think, you know, we're still in the early stages of these data lake adoptions, but I think you'll start to see this become much more common as, as most customers begin to adopt these, these standardized data lakes. Okay. All right, let's 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 move to semantics, like a focus on semantics, starting with the metrics layer, um, which which you redefined. Everyone was calling it a semantic layer until you were like, no, that's just BI metrics. Real semantics is a lot harder. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I think that metrics are part of the semantic layer. I just think it's only one, it's one, it's one part of it. And there's a lot more business semantics that live above it that historically have not been part of the database, but are part of business applications. And more and more, more those semantics will be stored in a, a knowledge graph um, repository of some kind. So, so let's talk about this. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about, well, now that we have Gen AI, we can used natural language and go text to SQL. Um, it turns out it's it's not so easy. Hard. Tell us, tell us why and tell us, you know, what you've been hearing. Well, it's, it's very obvious why in some senses. I mean, business analysts are smart people. I mean, if you think about it, they tend to know a fair amount about the business. And that's what, you know, they, they're they they're able to do something with the data, whether they use a tool like Tableau or they're working in SQL directly, whatever they're doing. But mostly they have an understanding of the business and what the business needs to do. And, you know, you you can't find that inside the database. I mean, you look inside those SQL databases, but those semantics are not there. And so, you know, the first thing is, is that you need to have the metrics, the business metrics defined. And historically, that has lived in the BI layer, which, you know what? It has been a convenient place for it to live for a long time, but it's not its long-term repository because those semantics need to be used by more than the BI engine. Um, so, but if you have, you know, if you have those pre-built, for example, Power BI customers have have semantics in place through DAX that can help and be used as as a way of 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 building the fundamental business semantics that can be leveraged to these models for to for for text to SQL. I mean, in general, I think the, the thing what people have learned is there's two things that are needed to 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 make these text to SQL things work with some degree of accuracy. One is is an existence of business symmetric business metrics, um, semantics that is accessible to the model, and the other typically is a history of queries that have been performed. Um, so it has references for for things that have been done in the past, so it can use it as examples. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of what a person does too, and a, a business analyst would do. Most business analysts look at previous queries, but but what you're but what you're saying is that um, like all these efforts to put an LLM interface on, uh, you know, corporate data and liberate it and and sort of democratize it so that everyone everyone inside and outside the company can now talk to all this analytic data that can't really happen until we have proper metric metric layers in there. To do the SQL generation, because, like from what I'm from from what I'm told by, well, you would probably know the the like Power BI as an example, that if you go beyond a modest schema and modestly complex question, it just falls over, and that's with a metric definition layer. Right now, like Snowflake Cortex Analyst, I'm told is single table, and they're having trouble with accuracy. In other words, there's no joins. So 
like it's some of these are succeeding with joins at higher rate. No, nobody's 100 percent accurate. First, let's just start off the fact yeah. that nobody's getting 100 percent accuracy right now. But but, you know, what we're finding and, and you know, we're still what? 15, 18 months into this, you know, into this work for people. It's not, this is relatively new work that we're starting to appear in commercial forms. And, and uh, what we're finding is, as I said, you, you know, you have to have that basis of two things. You have to have a semantic layer that tells you about the business model and, and allows the, the metric layer, the, the, uh, the model to be able to understand that as it builds the query. And the other thing is, is that you typically need to have a set of previously run queries that have been stored in some type of vector database, some type of semantic semantic index to look at and say, these are things that were done in the past. And with those two things together, you can start to get some pretty good some pretty good results. And I think we're starting to see that in some of in some of the vendors. Oh, so what you've stored, the previously run queries you use sort of like like um Google used um for originally, to go to enhance page rank, which is so. What did people? What's the signal that what's you get worked, from? What's worked? Yeah. In the past? What's what worked? have people done in the past? And and then you know the thing that's interesting that that you know when I was talking to some of the Microsoft folks about this that they said is you know they've got some advantages with Power BI because you know if you if you start with a dashboard that somebody has done, particularly if you have a validated dashboard. You know, that's a great, those are great examples that can be used by the model to, to form new queries. So the more work that people have put into around the business model and the more examples get created, the better the models can do. Um, and so the fact that people have done this in higher level tools like Power BI provides strong signal to the model to be able to do the right thing. But what I'm taking away from this is that this really enhances the existing BI vendors and others who have this semantic layer, um, at least metric layer, and and the data platform vendors who aspire to liberate their data and go around the BI vendors are are not really going to go anywhere until they have a metric definition layer. I think they'll all will need the metric definition layer. I agree with I agree with that. Whether they can go around the BI the BI vendors is another question. Even well. then separate okay. question. That's a separate right. question. So that's more of a human question than anything else, though, right? Because people are used to tools and things like that. Right. Um, actually, which leads me to my next question. When we take what 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 were KPIs that were in dashboards and 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 ML models, and then we put agents on on top of them. Um, and so they have they have predictions, they have um measurements about what has happened. So uh, measurements about what has happened, predictions about what will happen, and then they have actions that they can take based on that, and, and then they can learn from that. So that's an agent. What are the building blocks that, that this a single agent would need to reason over? And I'm thinking of semantic harmonization of the data and the APIs. You know, What are the building blocks that need to, to come together? Well, I mean, I think consistency, clarity of the role of the agent, clearly, what it's capable of doing and what it's not, you know, what is out of bounds for it to do. And then, you know, an understanding of, of, of the parameters, which you might call the business semantics for the decision. And then ideally some history of decision. I mean, these, if you think about what we just talked about with the SQL query, all the same things I think are required for the basis for, the, for an accurate uh, action plan for an agent. It's just that the agent has a, a, a side effect that it does something that might have downstream implications, potentially without human validation associated with it. And in, at least in today's world, that human validation relatively early is important. Now, over time, as these things, as accuracy improves and as we have his, as history of these things and we've seen successful implementations of these things, the ability for people to trust what these agents are doing will will increase over time, but you know this idea that, and I know that that the Microsoft folks and Charles Amon and these guys are talking about replacing all of of the the business systems with a bunch of agents that are cooperating. I do agree with that that direction. It's just that we have to make sure that the technology has reached the point of maturation where that will work effectively for customers. We're not quite there yet. We're definitely not quite there yet. So maybe maybe to finish up, let's talk about. Um... What is the new definition of an application? Because for decades, an application was like a data model, the business process model, the user interface to present the data and the processes. And now it looks like more and more of the 
processes are sort of generated on demand at the at the at the time of inference. The UI is generated to the extent there is one, maybe just to collect edits from from the supervising human, um, and and that there is a data model still, but that some of the data model might be generated on demand because it's borrowing pieces from different systems. So that's maybe one agent, but now we've got let's say an army of them, hundreds of them. Yeah. Yeah. Interoperating, what, interoperate, interconnected, inter interoperating agents. Yeah. Speculate on on what is the new sort of application model or container that you know because there's going to be multiple agents from multiple vendors and you're accessing legacy systems. So what makes this coherent and aligned? Well, it's interesting. I I would say I don't think we really know yet. Is the first is the first thing. Um, I'm not sure that ever, there is a coherent view by all the different vendors on it. I certainly don't have a coherent view. Uh, I believe that, the, that that these things will be guided by by a consistent semantic model in the form of some sort of connected knowledge graph. I've, I've believed that for some time. I think all of these pieces continue to, to to reinforce the need for that. But probably that's not sufficient. Probably there's a workflow engine or a process piece that sits in addition to this. You know, you can almost think of it as an agent operating system. But that agent operating system needs references. And and that's why I think you you need a the ability to store a a semantically coherent model of the business is a part of your data environment, and that's just a knowledge graph. I mean, what it is is a knowledge graph. Call it whatever you want. You know, call it something different, but that's what it is. And uh, uh, and have use that as a basis of how the agents will make their decisions. In a way, you've got data, you've got you've got semantics, you've got you know, a graph of interconnected agents, and then you have the intelligence that is sort of sitting on top of that. All right. I think at that point we should leave that for super cloud eight. What, what we'll elaborating on that vision. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for this stuff to evolve. It's all real or it's all really early. And most of the stuff is not yet working in production environments. I mean, I, I mean, finding customers that have successfully deployed these things is not that easy. Yeah. What's interesting though, I think, is that I, I I think I don't know to what extent like Microsoft and Salesforce backed into it, but there was you know there's the 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 pro code building of agents, which is all this gaggle of startups and that like Vertex AI and Google, but then Microsoft like Power Platform and Salesforce with their um, low code builders. I, I forgot the name. I, I I think it's more than just Einstein, but they're really the ones that are going to corporate developers and saying, we can help you build this army of agents that leverages your, you know, legacy application and data estate. I think any existing companies that have material business applications will want to enhance those to become an interconnected set of agents over the next few years. Exactly how those are put together, we're going to watch. All right. So with that, we'll, we'll, we'll put a pin on that for, for super cloud eight, Bob, thanks for joining us. Um, to the audience, thanks Bye. for watching. We'll be right back with more from SuperCloud 7, live and on demand from Palo Alto.